Uh, and the work I'll present, it, it has its roots all the way back uh, in my grad school days and continued during my postdoc years a little bit. And more recently, it's been uh, continued by some of my students and uh, collaborators. And also a little caveat, this, this is not a chiral object. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a silly symbol we've been using for our group's logo, that sort of thing. So, okay, very good. Uh, yeah, so the work that I'll present is uh, mainly uh, been done more recently by my student, uh, Peter Wu. Uh, uh, so that'll be kind of the bulk of some of the things I'll present. Uh, also, Shivang Agarwal and Olivia Liebman, they have also made contributions, uh, uh, particularly towards some of the things that I'll show towards the later part of the talk. Uh, this work also wouldn't have been possible with, without uh, uh, the help of these or the collaborations with uh, various people across, across the country, really. And uh, all the way down here, our, uh, my advisors from grad school will actually are acknowledged because, like I said, the seeds of this work really went back there. Okay, so... So here is kind of the uh, outline of the talk. Uh, so, so I'll tell you a little bit about chiral materials and why we care about chiral materials. Uh, and then I'll tell you how to write down the governing equations of uh, electronic structure for those materials. And then I'll describe two numerical methods for, for, these, uh, for solving those equations really. Uh, and then finally connected to a machine learning model uh, and then uh, end with a discussion of uh, where we are heading with all of this. Okay, so uh, chiral structures, formally, all of us are familiar. Chirality in chemistry just means handedness. Uh, so that's a way of saying, uh, if you say a structure or a molecule is chiral, that's just a way of saying that it, uh, it, you cannot superimpose it on its mirror image, okay? So that's a very generic uh, definition. However, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be thinking of a more specific kind of a chiral material. Uh, so those are chiral materials which look kind of like these. So I am really thinking about one-dimensional structures, okay? And to, for them to really become chiral, very often they would have some sort of twist. So they could have an intrinsic twist, for example, in a chiral nanotube, or they could have extrinsic twist. In other words, you could hold one of these nano ribbons and then actually apply a twist. Okay? So that's what I'm going to be thinking of. And so, uh, so these are structures that are going to be associated with twisting or helical symmetries. Some of them are, so that's kind of the key uh, place where the chirality sort of comes in. Uh, and sometimes they will be associated with cyclic symmetries as well. As you know, a nanotube can have these helical symmetries as well as cyclic symmetries and so forth. Um, and this definition, although I'm going to call it chiral, uh, you know, the, the fact that these structures of helical symmetries already subsumes the fact that in principle, I could set that twist to zero. Okay, if I do that, then the structure that I would get would be achiral or just a plain periodic type structure, 1D periodic structure, okay? So the methods that I'm going to be describing are generic that they can work with a structure like that or something which is typically considered achiral and something like that, okay? And we'll see that even for a structure like this, the sort of techniques that we'll describe are uh, in a lot of ways, you know, better to use than like a typical periodic method. Okay, so that's, that's a little view of chirality. So why do we care about chiral structures? Well, for one thing, this kind of chiral structures or 1D chiral materials are everywhere. So of course, all of us are familiar with different kinds of nanotubes, so elemental nanotubes, uh, but there is also nanotubes of uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, for example. Uh, you can have more complex nanotubes these days. Uh, there's been a lot of ongoing work with zeolites and so forth. So you know that's one example of where chiral materials show up. But also, you know, uh, metallic and metallic oxide ribbons and, and coils are pretty common. So those are intrinsic examples of chiral 1D materials, the sort of materials that we, we want to think about in this talk. And then there are also many examples from biology and biophysics. So these sort of proteins, basically, uh, this is the amyloid protein that's responsible for Alzheimer's. Uh, that's an intrinsically chiral structure, quasi 1D chiral structure. Tail sheets of viruses, that's another example. Uh, and also, you know, uh, you can see uh, these sort of uh, made up uh, structures, bio oriented structures. So these are DNA decorated uh, nano ribbons that uh, people have uh, come up with in the literature. So these are all, all examples of uh, chiral materials uh, of the kind that we want to think about in this talk. So, so this is kind of to say that, you know, chiral matter is well represented in many, many different kinds of branches of uh, science and technology, right? 
Uh, so why chiral materials are interesting is because they're very often associated with collective properties that are of interest. So they're oftentimes associated with unique optical, electric, and magnetic properties. So, uh, you know, we'll go into some examples of those, those sorts of things. Uh, and sometimes because of the fact that these structures are chiral or they don't have these, they break certain kinds of symmetries, they can show anomalous properties. Okay, so a famous kind of example, on, or let's say an example that was actually discovered in the 1990s, really, I think, or early 2000s, maybe, but has risen to prominence uh, recently is this example of uh, CIS, or chiral induced spin selectivity. What it is, is basically it's, people found out that it, originally the discovery was in biomolecules, that these kinds of chiral structures, depending on whether they're left-handed or right-handed, if you perform an experiment where you inject electrons at one end, then they act as a filter and allow either spin up or spin down electrons to come out the other end, okay, depending on whether they're light, right or left-handed. So in other words, this structure basically has anomalous spin transport, okay? So, so that, that idea somehow and related ideas that chirality kind of can be used as a handle for uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, particularly quantum hardware applications has recently been gaining a lot of steam. Uh, so if you want to read more about that, this is kind of a review paper on, on, on those lines, okay? So where these ideas of chirality are explored, uh, explored and how they can be used for uh, transduction and reading and writing of qubits and so forth. Uh, and then here is another example of a chiral structure and why that is interesting. So this is a tungsten disulfide uh, chiral nanotube. Uh, so this is not a typical single wall nanotube, but it, it, it is a nanotube and it's chiral. And it shows what's called non-reciprocal superconductivity. Okay, so this is a fairly recent paper where, where they actually experimentally measured this effect. So if you want to broadly understand what's happening with all these kinds of chiral structures, here's a very broad level overview. So roughly speaking, these chiral structures, they have these helical symmetries, right? And what that means is the governing equations due to certain invariances can result in the fact that effectively the atoms or the, the, uh, the, uh, the atoms which make up the molecules in the structure or the parts of the structure, they perceive the same environment. So this is to say that if, for example, a part of the structure has unpaired spin, then it might be due to the invariances in the structure that all the other atoms on the structure also has unpaired spin. And as a result of that, uh, the structure as a whole may be you know, uh, ferromagnetic, for example. Okay, uh, and so if you do see that, then you are going to see this in a way that's very different from bulk, basically. And this is a 1D structure, so these kinds of effects can add up. Okay, so, so that's part of the reason why these structures are likely to be associated with interesting material properties, collective properties particularly. And then as I said, the other reason why they might be interesting is because they break certain kinds of symmetry. So especially symmetries where uh, you know, the parity and the time and so forth symmetries come in, these structures break those symmetries in certain interesting ways. Uh, people even think of this sort of chirality in terms of uh, sort of having a pseudo-magnetic field sometimes. And so it's a way of kind of getting a special handle on the electronic states is, is, is the way to think about it. Okay, so, so of course, this picture that I showed, you know, this is just a very high, le high level view. I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, I would not suggest taking this too seriously, but at least it gives you a flavor of why one should care about these kinds of structures. Okay, so what am I going to talk about in this? So what I want to do is I want to develop a bunch of methods by which I can calculate the electronic structure of this chiral, these kinds of chiral materials, okay? And so I'll be talking about first principles methods and by first principles, I will mainly be focusing on constant DFT methods. Uh, and then uh, for that, I'll, I'll be going through real space as well as reciprocal space methods that, that work for these kinds of systems. And then towards the end, I'll show how this can be connected with suitable uh, machine learning type techniques to study these kinds of uh, materials, particularly their electronic structure. So before we jump into that, so a relevant question is, well, why can't we use what's already out there, right? So uh, for example, if you wanna take uh, uh, one of these chiral tubes, uh, why can't I plug it into a code like VASC or quantum espresso or something, a plain wave code, and why can't I use that? The reason is if you think about it, a little bit, you will very quickly see that the helical and cyclic symmetries that these structures have are going to not make your calculation feasible. So they can make the calculation infeasible very quickly, 
So for some of the calculations, in fact, that I'll describe uh, later in this talk, if you were to do this using a periodic code, your unit cell would have over 100,000 atoms. Okay, so you just can't do it. And also, you know, in the orthogonal directions, you would like to add in a vacuum padding and so forth that also will interfere with your calculations and, and so on. So there is a community of people who have thought about chiral and helical symmetries. And that's the set of people who've been involved in thinking about LCAO type methods. Right? So linear combination of atomic orbital methods. So this goes back to the work of Mintmeyer and White in 1993, where they were thinking of initially tight binding and then later also first principles calculations using LCAO type methods and exploiting these kinds of symmetries. Uh, unfortunately, despite serious looking, there is actually only one code that we could find which purportedly has this thing implemented, okay? And that's this code Crystal 7. And then we realized pretty early, I mean, pretty quickly that even that code has very serious limitations in, uh, in the way it allows you to do certain, you know, calculations and so forth. So in other words, it's not, it was not as general and, you know, it didn't have all the things that we would really like to calculate with this method. Okay. The other thing is, of course, this is not even going into the issue that LCAO, as you know, is, uh, is a very powerful sort of basis set. Uh, chemists love it, but also has issues with uh, convergence and basis set errors and so forth and so on. So what we would like to do is to have something like this, a plane wave code, for example, but that's for a, that works for a cardinal material. That's, that's one of the goals, basically. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of the, is, is there a question? Uh, okay, good. Okay, so that, with that background, so I want to get into a little bit of uh, the formulation and governing equations. Uh, and I'll describe the setup of the problem and how you, uh, you know, uh, set up the equations of, 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 uh, for a chiral material. Okay, so for the rest of this talk, whenever we think about a chiral material, I'm going to be thinking or chiral 1D material, I'm going to be going with sort of this kind of definition, which is that in order to describe this chiral material, I'll think of a cloud of points in space. Those will be my nuclear coordinates of atoms in the unit cell or fundamental domain. And then I'll have a discrete group of isometries, so rotations and tr translations, which will act on these points to produce the whole structure. And then of course, uh, you know, the group of isometries or, or the symmetry group, if you will, they, they cannot be arbitrary. They have to be something that's connected to this chirality or this helical symmetries and so forth. So broadly, the two kinds of symmetries that we'll be thinking about are usually in the literature, they would be called a one, one generator group or a two generator group. That's to do with the form of uh, this, uh, this group, whether there is one generator or two generators over here. But the way you should think about it is I can generate a structure like this. So a twisted nano ribbon, for example, or even a straight nano ribbon using this sort of a symmetry group. And I can generate a structure like a nanotube like that uh, using this sort of a symmetry group. That's, that's the way you should think about it. So the key difference is that this one, in addition to this crew transformation operation has these cyclic symmetries. That's, that's one of them, that's the main difference, okay? Okay, so, and then for the computational domain, what we'll assume is that this structure is going to be embedded, this whole infinite structure essentially will be embedded in a, in a cylinder, okay, uh, infinite cylinder, that's a global simulation domain. And then very typically, we are going to assume suitable decay of the wave functions away from the axis of the cylinder. So very often we'll apply Dirichlet boundary conditions on the surface of the cylinder, okay? Okay, so you have an infinite structure, just like in the case of a crystal or a 1D lattice, for example. And what we would like to do is to reduce that problem to the fundamental domain. Okay, so over here, I'm considering this one generator group K. So it's basically a kind of a coil-like structure as you are seeing over here. That's the entire problem I would like to reduce to, to something like this. And so what that amounts to is to write down a block theorem for that structure, okay? So if you're a physicist, then you would immediately recognize, oh, well, maybe the single particle Schrodinger operator basically has certain symmetries. It inherits the symmetry of this group, the structure that it has. And so then you would reason that uh, these uh, symmetry operations commute with the Hamiltonian and so forth and so on. And so you can write down a simultaneous basis of eigenstates. So all that is, uh, I would say, a physicist proof of doing things. Uh, I'm considering that this is a, you know, a institute for mathematics. So I think we should maybe think a little bit on more rigorous lines. So, so the right way to think about this really uh, is in terms of PDE theory. Uh, 
And it goes back to the work of O'Day and Keller in the 1960s, where they established the classical block theorem in a rigorous way. Okay. Uh, so, so the I'm not going to the uh, proof for how, what the proof exactly entails, but the statement is something like this for this case. So imagine you have this single particle Schrodinger equation, right? Uh, and then this V inherits the symmetry that you're interested in. So it could be this uh, helical symmetry purely or helical plus cyclic. Uh, so in this particular case, only the helical case is dealt with. Then for every real number eta, that's like your K point. Uh, there exist solutions to this equation that are of this answer that satisfy that answer. That's that's the statement of the theorem. Okay, uh, and so so this particular part will be group invariant. Okay, so the way you prove this is basically you take this answer, you put it into the equation, you get a linear elliptic problem uh, that has nice properties. So uh, you know, in particular, it it is uh, self adjoint has a, a compact resolvent and so forth, and then okay, so then you can write down. Now in practice. Uh, you don't actually need to put your k points or eta points, as we call them over here, uh, across the entire real line. So uh, in, in practice, what you just need is just a compact set. So you can think of this as the one-dimensional Brillouin zone. Okay. So in addition to this helical symmetry, if I have something like a cyclic symmetry, as I would do for a nanotube, then my Brillouin zone will be this cross a bunch of discrete number of uh, characters, basically, coming from the cyclic symmetry. Okay. So that's, that's what it is. Okay, so, so now why is this block theorem useful? So among other things, so, so the thing that I just showed you is an existence result, that there exist solutions to the single electron problem, which are like that. You can also prove a completeness result. So what that means is you can show that if you give me any function on the cylinder, uh, square integrable function, then there is a way by which I can decompose that function in terms of these helical block states. Okay, so that shouldn't be entirely surprising considering you have similar theorems in the classical periodic case, but this is exactly the analog of that. Uh, so the key player in all of this is basically this operator U, uh, which we call the helical block flow key transform. It's just like the regular block flow key transform, except you, you don't do translations, you apply the actual symmetry of the group, okay? And that, that's how you write it down. Uh, what this means is that you, this, this block flow key transform essentially in the language of Fourier analysis is that you are allowed to take your Hamiltonian, which is this, uh, this, this guy over here, and you're allowed to block diagonalize it in a suitable way. Okay, so this is the way you kind of make that language precise or rigorous. Okay, so you use, uh, so these are direct integrals by which you could, okay, so, so this is like basically writing down, if you will, a Fourier decomposition of an operator, but this operator in this case is an unbounded one. So you have to be a little bit careful about technicalities. All right, so that's so that's that's the uh, mathematical background. Okay, so why is this stuff useful? So as I mentioned, these block states exist and they are complete. So what they allow you to do is they 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 block diagonalize your Hamiltonian, but they also give you a nice way of deriving the equations of the system. Okay, so for example, the electron density, you have to do a little bit of manipulation. So, so you can start off with a definition of something like, you know, uh, the electron density matrix is something like the, uh, the Fermi Dirac function on this H. And then if you use the formalism of this direct integrals, then you can actually show that that's the expression you end up getting. So that's it's a, it's a good formalism to have. More, more importantly, you would really like to compute things like the ground state energy of the system via quantum theory and so forth, right? So in quantum theory, the electronic free energy is, has a kinetic energy part, right? And then there is an exchange correlation part. So in this talk, I'll just assume it's LDA or GGA. And the calculations that I'll show you is just actually LDA. It's not even GGA. But okay, that, that's, that's not a limitation or anything. And then there is, a, there is the electrostatic interaction part, which is the electron, electron, and electron nucleus uh, electrostatic interactions. There is the kinetic, uh, you know, this is the entropy part basically, which is coming from smearing. And very importantly, there is also in practice this non-local pseudo-potential part. So that has to do with the core states of electrons that are actually there in the calculation, but you sort of project them, you want to compute states which are projected against them so that they're not, I mean, okay, so, okay, right. So, so that's, so that's, so that's, that's all, you know, so that's kind of the recipe for writing down the entire free energy of the, of the, of the system. So for a term like this, EX0, 
you want to write down the energy per unit fundamental domain, that's fairly straightforward. You just take the, the density of this, of this functional basically, and you integrate against it. That's, that's straightforward. The formalism that I described earlier, that's particularly useful for terms like these, okay? The kinetic energy. That's because you can look at the expressions that you had for a finite case, right? And you can use uh, ideas about traces of operators and so forth. In this case, uh, you know, it's, it's a calculation that roughly is like this. I just wrote that down if you care. Uh, and you can rigorously give meaning to each of these terms. Okay, so that's the kinetic energy part. The part that is slightly non-trivial, and we discovered that even in the plane wave, the periodic setting, there are well-known references where the term is incorrectly written. Okay, well, pretty well-known references. I mean, obviously the uh, community at large must know how to write this down correctly because it's implemented in, I don't know, hundreds of codes at this point. But uh, the right way to derive the term apparently is fraught with, uh, I guess, subtleties. So anyway, the, if, you, if you follow this formalism, you can actually show that what you have to do is to, you take an inner product against the block Floquet transform of the projection function. So that's, that's the right form actually. And then, 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 it's, then it, everything works out and so forth. Okay, so now you have this energy. So you've formed a recipe of sort of getting the constant energy of the system uh, via this block Floquet transform. You now want to take the Euler Lagrange equations of that energy to get your governing equations, right? So you take the Euler Lagrange equations, those would be the Consham equations for the helical structure. Nothing unusual. So you have the kinetic energy exchange correlation. So I'm assuming local or semi local. This phi is the electrostatic part. So there is a electron density part, and then there is this uh, pseudo charge part coming from the nucleus. You know, so I'm clumping together the electron, electron, and the electron nuclear interaction basically. And the only sort of unusual or uh, slightly non-trivial one is is really this one, the non-local part of the pseudo potential. Okay, so that's that's how you write on that term. If you if you do the Euler Lagrange, this is this is what automatically falls up. Okay, so I have my governing equations for the system. And now I have to start thinking about computational strategies for discretizing those equations and solving them, okay? So this is where you realize that these structures basically are very nicely described in this alternate system of coordinates, which we call helical coordinates, okay? So, so these are the uh, surfaces of, uh, you know, the constant surfaces of the helical coordinates. So, the helical coordinates are r, theta one, theta two. So this r is just like a regular cylindrical coordinates thing. Uh, theta one is a proxy for z, if you will. It's just scaled. This theta two is the only unusual one. If your system is achiral, in other words, there is no twist, this alpha parameter is zero, then this theta two would just sort of become the same cylindrical coordinate angle, okay, the polar angle. But uh, in, a more, in a more generic case, in a chiral case, that's, this is what you get, okay? So and that's, those would be what those coordinates sort of look like. Uh, the utility of you kind of writing down or using this coordinate system is that your fundamental domain, for example, in case of a nanotube, you might imagine that it will be sort of a little sector like that. But using these coordinates, you can map it into a cuboid. Okay, so then it's much easier to set up a mesh and do your equations, solve your equations, uh, you know, in, in, in these coordinates, essentially. So if you do that, so um, maybe these equations are not very clear anyway. But you, you, get, you get sort of a messy part uh, coming from the Laplacian because the Laplacian in helical coordinates is the kinetic energy term essentially is a little bit messy, but you can write down all the terms and, and so forth. And so this is what you're less kind of tasked to solve. So you need some kind of method by which you can discretize these equations in a suitable way and solve them. Okay. So that's, that's the setup of our problem at this point. Okay. So now I'm gonna to describe to you two strategies for doing that. So the first one will involve finite differences. Uh, and then the second one is going to involve, uh, it's a spectral method essentially. Okay, so here is the finite difference scheme. So the particular kind of system, especially going forward, because I'll show you some examples of the kind of calculations you can do with this method, is imagine I have a nanotube embedded, uh, in a, you, know, you know, imagine that there is an infinite kind of nanotube. Here is my little fundamental domain. It could be a chiral tube or a tube which has been twisted or something, and so there is a little slant. And, and for practical purposes, I'm going to imagine these tubes are going to be large enough radius so that uh, you know, there is an inner radius of the domain and there is an outer radius of the domain and the tube is sitting somewhere in between, okay? 
so then I can discretize my derivatives in this in these nasty equations, right? Uh, using finite differences. So typically, in electronic structure calculations, uh, even for uh, <coughs> for Cartesian coordinate systems, people use higher order finite differences, and that's what we used over here as well. So the for the calculations that I'll show you, typically 12th or 14th order differences are employed. Uh, there are known formulas for how to expand these things out. One kind of interesting thing is no matter which order difference you use, the integrals don't uh, use these higher order formula. You just use the basic sort of quadrature rule. Okay, so you just multiply it with the integration measure and then just the value of the functions. It's not some other fancy uh, kind of rule. Okay, so you do that and then... Uh, so you, then you go about you know, setting up your equations and so forth. And then sort of to your horror, you discover very soon that you're implying finite differences in curvilinear coordinates essentially. And even though you started with a Hermitian eigenvalue problem, your eigenvalue problem that you end up with is non-Hermitian, okay? Uh, so this is a problem that has been addressed actually uh, by uh, Professor uh, Gigi and Professor Gali in the 1990s, uh, they were, uh, aware of this, and they mentioned in their work on adaptive coordinates that the smaller you make your mesh spacing uh, and the higher the order of the difference, it turns out those discretized operators become more and more like their infinite dimensional counterparts. And so they become more and more Hermitian. Oops, excuse me. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So, so now there is a, so, okay, so that's, that's one issue. Uh, so, Okay, so you might say, well, uh, in practice, and this was their observation as well, uh, these, you know, the fact that this, your operator is non-Hermitian, you know, may not uh, cause too much of problems, uh, which actually does turn out to be the case. The other problem that you confront is that even if you're dealing with a relatively large nanotube, there is a coordinate singularity right at the axis of the tube, okay? It's, a, it's an artificial singularity, it's not a real thing, okay? And what that means is, the, you know, even for a reasonable practical size nanotube or one nanometer tube or whatever, your, the effect of that coordinate singularity is going to raise your condition number of the system by more and more, okay? So you will have to contend with that, okay? So, uh, so you know, the, in other words, in this sort of finite difference method, the smaller your tube radius gets, your condition number gets poorer because of the influence of that singularity. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have implemented this method into in a MATLAB code, which has key portions rewritten in C. Uh, so because our op operator is Hermitian, is non-Hermitian, you cannot use standard eigenvalue solvers for it. I mean, um, uh, for example, uh, you know, codes like um, Abinet or uh, Quantum Espresso, LOBPCG is a well-known solver. You can't use that. But what you can use is the non-Hermitian analog of that, which was invented by Chow and uh, one of my colleagues at LBL, uh, Eugene Vecherinsky. It's called uh, GPLHR, uh, which is exactly like a non-Hermitian analog of log PCG. Okay, so you can use that to diagonalize your Hamiltonian. Uh, we found actually a lot of success with uh, Chebyshev polynomial filtered subspace iterations. That's typically a method for Hermitian eigenvalue problems. But uh, kind of very uh, kind of commensurate with uh, this, the observations in this paper, it's somehow even if you end up using this, uh, which is really a, a method for Hermitian problems, it doesn't affect you that much. So you, have, you do get some uh, imaginary parts to your eigenvalues because, uh, okay, but they're typically very small. And so you can just ignore them and go on with your calculation. Okay, so that's what we use. So between these two kinds of methods, GPLHR is, uh, going to take more time per iteration. That's the typical observation. However, it takes overall lesser SCF iterations because somehow the diagonalization is a bit more exact than something like uh, KFC, okay, Chebyshev filtering. Uh, we used uh, the poison problem was solved using GEMRES. Uh, we accelerated it using sort of, uh, you know, uh, pull iterations. And then for structural relaxation, uh, what we've used is a, is a fast inertial relaxation engine because as I'll show you, we'll do calculations where you take one of these tubes or something and you can distort them and then you want to let the atoms go where they want to go. Okay, okay so that's that. <clears throat> so here are some uh, numerical results first. Uh, so before we even get into the uh, kind of more materials results. So 
Here are plots that are showing you the accuracy of these uh, of this finite difference implementation in terms of convergence in the energies and forces. So in this case, basically the thing that we are comparing against is a highly converged version of the of the results. Okay, and so you get convergence rates which are five and a half and six and a half, which are somewhat lower than what you would get for um, for typical uh, you know Cartesian finite differences. But you know it's nevertheless systematically convergent and so forth. The harder thing is to make sure that the code that you have is going to is producing the right results in the first place. Okay, I mean it's converging against itself to something. Who says that something is correct? And so we had to sort of get into really these kind of edge cases where it could be simulated with our code as well as with a standard code like Abinet. Uh, like you know maybe you can make a nano coil or something like just a single atom or uh, and so on. So those are the sort of examples we worked out. And we did make sure that our results agree with Abinet up to four places of decimal and so on. Okay, so use the same pseudo potential, same exchange correlation, you get exactly the same results as much as possible. Okay, and then our in our code, uh, the it's consistent with respect to energies and forces. So in other words, if I take my energies right and I uh, fit a spline through it, and then I start moving my atoms. Uh, then the values that I get of the derivatives should be the forces that the code calculates by doing Hellman Feynman. So that's this is a plot of that. Okay, uh, so as you might imagine, because this method intrinsically builds on symmetry, uh, the more symmetry that you kind of throw into the problem, the better it gets gets at it. So uh, here is a little here is a plot. I mean, I'm sorry, these numbers are too small maybe to see all the way at the back, but essentially this is showing you the time taken, normalized time taken. Uh, per SCF step or the various components of an SCF step, depending on whether for a problem you are exploiting both cyclic symmetry or helical symmetry or no symmetry at all, that sort of thing. Okay, And between this number and there, where, where no symmetry was exploited, and this is where both cyclic and helical symmetries are exploited, there is basically kind of uh, something like 20 times difference. Okay, And this is not a particularly large problem. Uh, and so this is also a similar kind of a thing with the forces that, that, that you can see. Okay, so very, very drastic difference between the total time that is required and so forth. Okay, uh, so in fact, because the symmetry, you know, if you put in this K-points, it's embarrassingly parallel, you can actually start to do really large tubes, right? So silicon, for example, because you can grow silicon nanotubes through chemical vapor deposition, uh, you can get nanotubes, but you can also get tubes whose diameters are all the way up to the micron scale. Okay, so and this is an example to show that you can actually use this method to simulate something that has a micron diameter. Okay. So that's that. So that's the DOS coming, the density of states coming from, from, from that problem. Okay, so now I'll change gears a little bit and talk a little bit about material properties that we can get using this method, and then I'll come back to numerics uh, shortly. So one of the things that we can do with this is, if you have a two-dimensional material, and now there are hundreds of them, I can sort of fold it in my code, then it sort of is like a nanotube, right? And through that process, I can estimate bending energies. But this is, I'm getting those bending energies from quantum mechanics, okay? So we did this calculation uh, uh, where we looked at the different kinds of bending energies and the bending stiffness, really, for different kinds of 2D materials. So graphene is, turns out to be largely isotropic. Turns out cousins of graphene like silicine and germanine, uh, they're not that isotropic. They have stronger anisotropies depending on which direction you fold them. So this is a way of saying that the bending energies along for armchair and zigzag tubes are different for those, for those systems. That's, that's what that means. And for phosphorine actually, which is also a 2D material, uh, it does, anisotropy is very strong. It's like a factor of two and a half. Uh, and what is even interesting is, you know, graphene, you oftentimes hear about these strong carbon-carbon bonds, uh, which is true. It, it is out of those group 4A elements, it is stronger than the rest of them. But phosphorine is like significantly uh, more rigid uh, in terms of bending stiffness, at least, at least by the simulations. Okay, so bending is fine. But now what I want to do is I want to get back to twisting. So I have a tube like this. It's already rolled up. I can now start to twist it in the simulation. So I have parameters, remember, in my, in my group, that alpha that I showed you, which I can vary, and I can then relax my atoms and so forth, and then that can give me the response to twist. So for the range of twists that we considered, we explicitly stayed away from, uh, from nonlinearities and so forth, instabilities, really torsional instabilities, uh, 
we, we were able to uh, show that basically, you know, the result that you get from linear elasticity, which is that the torsional stiffness varies in a cubic manner with the system's radius, with the tube's radius. So that actually holds, uh, okay? So this is, that's that exponent right there. And the, the prefactor is, it's a, it's a measure of how tough these various tubes are. So we have looked at silicon, uh, carbon, germanium, tin, and so forth. So that's 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 the sort of calculation you can do. Uh, more interestingly, uh, I mean, okay, mechanical properties are good, but ultimately this is about electronic structure. So if you have a normal nanotube, so this is a nanotube of silicon, and you did its electronic structure by a standard periodic method, its electronic states are going to be very large, you know, densely populated in in that way. The band diagram is going to look very busy because there are so many states to consider in a periodic setting. But because you've done the right symmetries, you can get band diagrams which are far cleaner, okay? Uh, because you can, you know, take bands along the helical direction or along the cyclic direction and so forth. And in particular, you can study things like, you know, what happens when I take a tube and twist it or stretch it. So for example, in some of these tubes, if you twist them, there's a very tiny sliver of a band gap that opens up. That's very easy to spot using diagrams like these. Okay, so that's the utility of right, doing the symmetry correctly. Another utility of doing the symmetry correctly. Uh, and so we, we did a bunch of, so my student, Peter, he, he kind of in a very dedicated manner did a whole bunch of these calculations. And he found that for a lot of these tubes, uh, it's, it's known for carbon, for example, that if you take an armchair carbon nanotube and you start twisting it, it goes from being a metallic state to, in, to a semiconducting one and back to metallic and back to, and, and so forth. So there's an oscillation. And he found these oscillations also happen in these other kinds of tubes. And moreover, he actually found some scaling laws. Uh, so it turns out that the period of oscillation for these tubes varies in an inverse quadratic manner with the tube radius. So that you can fit the data and automatically see this sort of uh, behavior pop out. Okay. All right, so, <clears throat> okay. So now I'm going to switch gears again. And now I'm going to try to address the problems that I had with this finite difference method, okay? So remember the finite difference method was good. It's giving us these interesting results, uh, but there are some fundamental issues with it. A, unless I do an explicit treatment of the core singularity, I can't really deal with a tube uh, system which is like a nano ribbon or something, okay? Because there is a coordinate singularity right where the ribbon would be. Uh, B, my, Hermitian, my operator is non-Hermitian, okay? C, that core singularity is going to really, unless again, I do something about it, it's going to poorly affect my calculation. So the idea in this case was, can we write down an analog of plane waves, but for the chiral 1D structures, okay? And so indeed you can do that. So the, the, the basic thinking is that normal plane waves, e to the power i k dot x are eigenfunctions of the Laplacian with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, back in my grad school days, we, I worked out some versions of um, uh, plane waves, if you will. So we call them spherical waves, which work well with uh, point group symmetries. And this is exactly the analog of those kinds of things, except these are plane waves, which work with helical symmetry. So that's what they look like. So they have these exponentials, just like a regular uh, plane wave does, but there is this Bessel functions that, 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 that are sitting over there. Okay. Uh, so the utility of having something like this is that I can put this into my governing equations and my kinetic energy operator is immediately taken care of. Okay, that's, that's immediately diagonalized. And then this thing automatically also, the kinetic energy automatically gives me a basis set controlling factor, the energy cutoff. I can exactly do that, right? So I can choose all waves which have energy less than a certain cutoff. Uh, and then the, there is still, if you're thinking of the single electron Schrodinger, you can still, you'll still have the potential part, the kinetic energy is diagonalized. So that we handled using a pseudo spectral method, just like it's handled in a normal plane wave uh, code. Uh, but that for that you need fast transforms. So you need a quick way to go between things expressed in your base in this basis and on a real space grid, essentially. So you know because it's got this form, so you can use two-dimensional FFTs in this direction. But in the radial direction, what you have to do is um, you do quadrature. Okay. So you can use fast transforms that are fast angle transforms and so forth. But we found in practice that uh, at least for the sizes of bases that we were looking at. Uh, you know, the plane quadrature using, uh, uh, using Gauss-Jacobi nodes uh, works, works faster than other methods. So that's, that's what we did. So the, Hermitian, the Hamiltonian is now automatically Hermitian. The, these basis functions were designed in a way that that coordinate singularity is automatically removed. Uh, 
right? And now because of this, uh, because you have fast transforms, you can do fast matrix vector products, okay? And you can use iterative diagonalization. Uh, so here is uh, kind of, uh, this is a plot that shows you how fast the transforms can be done. This is the scaling of those transforms. If you're doing this in a naive way, you get kind of the expected quadratic uh, kind of scaling, quadratic in the total basis set size. If you, if you do it in, the, in, the, in a good way uh, using FFTs and so forth, you can keep the cost kind of almost sublinear. I mean, this is not really going to be sublinear, but you know, at least for the range of basis set size that we were considering, uh, you know, it's, it's nearly kind of something like uh, order N essentially in the basis set size. Uh, so the slope in this particular case is about 0.8, so, okay. And then uh, the preconditioners that people use for plane waves, they sort of, if you modify them in the right way, they kind of work out. So this is showing that I can do these diagonalization via log PCG and uh, the preconditioner basically irrespective of the system size that, so this is like larger and larger system chosen, uh, larger and larger number of basis functions chosen. So the, the thing converges nicely. Okay, so now I, with this method, so here are just some demonstration calculations to show you that this method also truly works. Uh, so among other things, you get spectral convergence, okay, which you would like in a normal plane wave kind of type of method. So as I take my basis set size, the error basically goes down via uh, like a curve on a log log plot. Okay, so that's that's that. In contrast, if I if I do this finite difference, that's a straight line. So that shows this polynomial kind of uh, decay basically in the error. Okay, so curve versus straight line. Okay, and then uh, so you can show that you know various other kinds of uh, things. So the band gap is not expected to show that kind of behavior, but uh, you know because it's a difference of two kind of quantities. But nevertheless, you can see all sorts of quantities of interest uh, give you you know they converge in the right way and so forth. And finally, here are some examples. Uh, so which we compared, uh, you know, so these are tubes, which we can do uh, using our old method, for example. But here are some ribbons and uh, nano wires, which we couldn't do. And so they are compared against reference plane wave results. results and, and so uh, this, this code works as expected. So that's, so, so that's what, what that's trying to show you. Uh, for this smaller, especially kind of nano tubes, this spectral method can be significantly faster. Okay, because it's not having to contend with those, uh, uh, you know, other issues basically. Okay, so now uh, for the, uh, before I kind of start wrapping up, I'll uh, go on to a discussion of uh, uh, a machine learning model. So, so here is the deal. So we, you know, my student Peter, he generated lots of these data from his simulations of this tubes twisting and stretching and changing the electronic states. And at some point we said, well, we have so much data, what should we do with it, right? And so then it sort of became an interesting question is can, how is it possible to learn that data? Okay, so in other words, can I train a machine learning model using this first principles method, specialized first principles method, right? Uh, and can I predict electronic density and nuclear pseudo charge and stuff like that, okay? Electronic fields. Uh, so, that's what this work is. So this is kind of, uh, joint work with, uh, with um, uh, Shushanta Ghosh and his student, uh, Shashank Patrutkar at Michigan Tech. And so what we looked at was, we said, let's consider a simple material system. Let's consider mm -hmm. armchair carbon nanotubes. And now what I'm going to do is I can distort that system. Uh, excuse me. I can, uh, sorry about that. I can distort that system uh, in different kinds of ways. So I can pull it, I can twist it and so forth. So there's a system and there is geometry. So the geometries of the system and then there are loading conditions. And now what I would like to do is somehow the ab initio simulations, if you give it those conditions, it's going to relax the system and it's going to produce the electron density as well as the density of the nuclear pseudo charges. But I would like to kind of learn this data and do this uh, through uh, machine learning model essentially. So is that possible? So in this case, the fields that you're trying to predict are roughly for the discretization choices we looked at was roughly about 60,000 dimensional. Okay, so that's, that's just, the, just to give you an estimate of how big the, the data is. And then because if I know this electron density and the nuclear pseudo charges, I can calculate everything else as a post-processing step. I can get my band diagram as a single diagonalization step and so forth. So, so we used uh, Sobol sequencing. We did fairly some of kind of routine things actually. 
the main thing that we found out, so the way our machine learning model works is the for the data, we first do a dimensionality reduction. So basically it's just principal component analysis. So it's unsupervised learning, if you will. And then the, the coefficients of the principal components are predicted using the neural network. So, so you give the neural network the geometry and the loading parameters, it predicts the coefficients of the, of the, of the um, that will go for, uh, you know, reconstructing the, the fields. So what is interesting are the following is that to capture even like 99.99% of the variance, uh, only seven and 15 uh, principal components were required. And I'll come back to this point. If you look at this plot, just look at the electron density. This is the variance in electron density. Actually to capture well over 90%, just two principal components are enough in the density. So somehow the, all this electronic structure data, this code is calculating all these complicated things, but fundamentally there are some very low dimensional modes that this thing is picking out. Okay, and because of this, uh, and you know, the data that's being produced is also the symmetry adapted. And so in some sense, the system is fairly constrained to do uh, and so forth. But because of this, we could train our neural network with just about 120 data points. So you're predicting a full three dimensional vector field. Okay, but it's just that you train it with 120 points. Okay, uh, and so of course the neural network, once it's trained, it's significantly faster. So prediction is a fraction of a second, training is 15 minutes or so. And then the post-processing about takes 30, 20, 30 minutes, something like that. Okay, so data, here, here are some plots. So the, here are some uh, chart plots to show you that the, NRM, uh, the, the NRMSE values of rho and B, these fields basically are uh, well within acceptable limits. Uh, this chart is showing you basically uh, calculations that were done with the rho and B as post-processing steps. So various energies and so forth. So you can get energies and, and uh, you know, energies to one millihertz accuracy pretty easily. Even the band gaps and so forth that you do using a single kind of a step come out to be extremely accurate actually. So, so here actually in this plot, the, the band diagram that you get from the machine learning model and the, the ground truth, which is the full DFT calculation are basically kind of the same. Okay, so there, there isn't much of a difference. So what is particularly interesting are these two columns in this, in this plot. That's because these are test, test data for cases that is well beyond the training, basically. So this kind of shows that this model is pretty generalizable. Uh, so of course, when you talk about machine learning, you talk about generalizability, that's a key thing. The other thing you need to talk about is interpretability. So what is exactly the model doing? Uh, and that goes back to this question, why is it that just two principal components were enough to capture like 90% of the variation in row. So once you visualize them, you start to realize what this model is basically doing is, it's trying to figure out the electron density just between the bonds, okay? So once you do that, then you, you know, if, if it, so once the system is distorted or twisted or something, the nuclear coordinates are going to move, they're going to relax and so forth, but then accordingly, the electron density between the bonds, between these things is going to change and basically, that's what it's tracking, okay? So in the plot for the pseudo charges, these, these things basically show it's trying to track the convection of the pseudo charge as it moves around due to relaxation effects. And this thing shows basically it's kind of tracking the changes in the electron density. Okay, so I'm nearly at the end of the thing. So I'll just <coughs> quickly uh, kind of uh, <coughs> tell you about uh, what we are doing at this point. So, the goal is now that we have this uh, kind of tools uh, to kind of branch out into different kinds of extensions of this very basic uh, setup. So the calculations that I've shown you are uh, kind of ground state DFT calculations with some relaxation and so forth. But you know there are many properties of interest, right? So those are embellishments, if you will, to the basic DFT model. And so that's that's those are kind of the things that we are uh, kind of going after. So uh, correlated properties involving spin and so forth. Uh, the in these one-dimensional materials, the uh, the Berry phase basically it goes by the name of a Zach phase. That's uh, that's something that's that's of a lot of interest, and so that's where this kind of framework that Lin developed might be useful for getting those one-year functions in a nice way. And then of course, um, uh, you know, these uh, <coughs> the, there are calculations one could do using uh, linear response theory and so forth. Uh, and the hope is that basically this will help us uncover new kinds of materials with uh, very interesting properties and you know lots of different kinds of applications. So one interesting case are these galphalol nanowires, uh, which we'd like to understand because they they are this is a um, this this material shows magnetic restriction and so forth. 
Okay, so related to this, so I'll just, so here is on those lines of kind of discovering new materials, if you will. So one of the things that our group recently found out is what we think is a sort of a new allotrope of carbon. So this was done using calculations, using these methods that I just discovered, that, that I just described. So it sort of looks like a carbon nanotube, but it's not a carbon nanotube. The holes are sort of bigger. It's a little bit different. Uh, it's pretty stable. So it's basically, it's not as stable as a regular pristine carbon nanotube. Uh, it's, it's about half EV away, basically, from, uh, from fullerenes, essentially. Uh, so, so it's reasonably stable, I guess, half EV, I mean, depending on, uh, you know, how you think it could be, it, it's large, but okay. So basically, it's possible, possibly these, these are like these metastable states, which somehow, I don't know, maybe they are there, or we definitely like to find out. The reason why we're interested in these are because each of these tubes, they sort of their band diagram kind of looks like a carbon nanotube, except there's a very important key difference. They have a flat band right at the Fermi level. Okay. So a flat band is typically, and, a, and of course, there's a corresponding jump in the uh, density of states, uh, singular peak. Okay. So that's usually the sign that you might expect to see some sort of correlated electronic phenomena in this. So one of my collaborators, he's uh, used our DFT calculations for this, uh, for this material to set up a tight binding model. And the next step for us is to kind of try to do uh, a DMRG sort of calculation with, uh, you know, using... Uh, like like in a sort of LDA plus U kind of thing. So you use the the orbitals that you get from DF2 to calculate your U, set up set up the Hamiltonian, and then uh, try to uh, really go after those correlated states. And so the kind of thing that you see, you you see this sort of what's called quadratic touching. So these uh, bands come up and then they touch this uh, the state. We're interested in seeing what happens. Are these states topologically protected? For for example. Uh, we have seen that once you start distorting these, these states, I mean, basically, uh, they don't really go away. So, so that's, that's already something quite interesting. And then, so here are some other kind of uh, directions that we are pursuing. The machine learning stuff especially has applications to multi-scale modeling. Um, uh, the right way to think about these new phases of matter or also even interfaces is to think about uh, branch following and bifurcation where you can have symmetry doubling and so forth. So that's, that's another direction that we've been thinking about. And finally, this framework gives you a way to do calculations of SIS from first principles, the spin selectivity effect that I mentioned. Okay, so for example, you can use this Hamiltonian that you got, put it into a Landauer or a, an NEGF kind of formalism and try to calculate the spin currents. Okay, so that's, that's, that's uh, where we are. So in summary, so I, I've told you about chiral 1D materials and hopefully convinced you that these are interesting materials to look at. Uh, so, and already we're seeing signs that they might be associated with many kinds of new and interesting material properties. And broadly, what I have been describing is our, uh, our uh, efforts in trying to have a set of systematic computational tools for characterizing these materials. Okay. And here are the associated uh, papers and preprints and acknowledgements. And, and that's it. Thank you. I'll take any questions. <laughs>